Hello and welcome to our epic chat today. My name is Jennifer Shu, and I am the head of US development at Epic Foundation. So Epic fights to change the lives of disadvantaged children and youth around the world. Using a VC inspired philanthropy model, we have vetted over 4,000 social organizations to create our portfolio of 26 high impact nonprofits, one of which will be featured today. First of all, a bit of housekeeping. The majority of the time will be an AMA for those of you in the audience. So please, as you think of questions for our awesome guest, please add them to the questions tab or upvote the ones that you'd really love to see answered. So with that, over to you, Paul Antoine. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Paul Antoine and I'm in charge of our community of pledgers here at Epic France. Uh, as you may know, the Epic Pledge is a great way for entrepreneurs and investors to add purpose to your business life and as a, an opportunity as well to join a great community. Uh, as a founder, you promise to give a, to Social Good a percentage of your future success from an exit and as an investor, a percentage of your carried interest or management fees. The Epic Pledge is not legally binding, so it's just a simple way to add purpose to your everyday and it can have a huge impact. Today, we welcome one of our wonderful pledgers as a guest, the managing partners of Kima Venture, uh, one of the world's most active early stage investors uh, in the world, Jean de la Roche Brochard, or should I say the human machine? Hello. <laughs> thank, thank <you> <laughs> That'll be your new you. nickname. Thank you, Jean, for being here and for being part uh, of our community. Uh, before we dive into your journey and vision, allow me to tell you that at Epic, we are all about uh, giving back. And for each webinar of this series, the speaker chooses one organization from the 26 high impactful organizations of our portfolio, um, helping vulnerable children and youth around the world. And all optional donations from you, the attendees, will go to, the, to supporting the featured organization. So today, John has chosen to support new classrooms, which enables personalized learning for every student by meeting them at their own level with personalized content and instruction each day. You will see a donation link pop up on your screen. You can click on it and it will open a new window and won't take you away from the epic chat. So please give what you can and I hope you'll enjoy the discussion. Back to you, Jennifer. Great, thank you so much, PA. Um, so before we begin, I just wanted to quickly introduce the other uh, members of the Epic Pledge team. So come on stage, awesome. So this is Debbie, she's based in UK and she leads uh, all of our pledge efforts in that region. And then this is Pac in Belgium. So. Hello, salut. Hello. Et bienvenue au Belge. Go team. Yeah, All right. Said, but in English. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks. So um, I want to jump straight in. So Kima currently has a portfolio of 850 portfolio companies. You invest yeah. in about 100 startups per year at a rate of two exactly. per week globally. So how have you developed and sustained this pace? Uh, to be very honest, I don't know how we did that because when I joined in 2015, the pace was already 100 startups a year. And okay. so I told Xavier, how do we do 100 new startups a year? Is like, and he was like, you know, just join, you see it. It just happens. And it happened. And so every year we've been invested 100 new in uh, about 100 new startups a, a, a year. And just by you know following the flow of receiving inbound deal flows, uh, reaching out to entrepreneurs, knowing that we would select approximately ten of them every month, and so it's been like that for, for almost a decade now. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. Um, so I want to dig a little bit deeper. I feel like you you have a secret to share with us. So I was scrolling through your Twitter feed, and I saw a screenshot. Um, of like this alert that you posted that made me do a double take. So it said, Kima Ventures, you're a bad VC. You haven't voted in the last two weeks. I am disappointed in you. You have 504 startups that, and then dot, 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 it just cuts off from there. So can you explain what What happened? is that? You want no, to know what is that? that? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a matter in every job we do of accountability. And one way of, of putting accountability in front of you mm. is to develop automatic tools to remind you the job that you have to do. And so we, ha we have this kind of in-house uh, sorting tool, kind of a Tinder for deal flow, 
on which we receive uh, inbound deals and on which we also scrap new companies from the media, from product and from YC, from Twitter. Mm. And then every week, uh, all of us, we just uh, kind of go through this list. And it's a list of 200 or, or 250 new startups every single week. So if you don't vote on those startups, if you don't go through the list, uh, you're screwed. So it's uh, so if, if I don't do that, I receive an automatic email from the system saying, hey, Jean, you didn't vote this week. You should do it. And then that's about it. Got it, got it. So there's uh, three folks on your team, right? Yes, who, Alex S, Alex who is a tech guy, uh, who joined in 2015, mm -hmm. uh, just like me. And Jeanne, uh, who joined us approximately 18 months ago as an intern, and uh, we hired her last summer. And before that, we had Eleonore and Rose in the team as well. But mm -hmm. they left two years ago to launch their own company. Got it, got it. So when you say you go through 200 per week, you know, you're going through 200 a week, and then it goes to Alexis, and then it goes to... Everyone yeah. go through 200 a week. And Everyone then, 200 a week. Yeah, and depending on, on, you know, the kind of sector you like, or uh, how busy you are in a, in a given week, uh, we just dispatch automatically the deal flow. But basically, anyone in the team can decide at any moment to take a meeting and decide mm -hmm. to invest in the company. Without consulting the other two? Of course, we, sh we, of course we share an email, you know, just to, to gather thoughts and questions and, uh, and remarks yeah. because you never know what you can bump into. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, it's more on a, on a I mean, we consult the yeah. others, and then everyone can take their own decision. Ah, interesting. Um, it seems like you can move uh, quite fast with a process like that. Yes, but also because we, we write small checks. It's 150K per deal, 100 times a year. So mm -hmm. out of those 100 deals, we have, uh, I don't know, like 10 crazy companies, like uh, ones that we invest in 2016, and I like to talk about it, it's called Boom, uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of a, of a, a, a new supersonic plane uh, that came out oh, of wow. YC in 2016. This is the kind of deal that we can do with Schema because we write so many checks that we can do those, those big bets and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, just press that it will work out, even though in most cases it, it doesn't. Right. Actually, that reminds me of uh, another portfolio company that I saw, Orbital Technologies. So they let people um, basically lease space in like a little rocket, and they can send that payload out to out to space. So really? <laughs> they're in your portfolio company. Maybe maybe you didn't review this one, but um, I, I thought it was it? pretty unique. Orbital Technologies. So I was looking into that one. So space, supersonic airplanes, very cool. Um, so shifting yeah. gears, uh, you know, pretty, pretty drastically here, obviously these days, um, you know, the pandemic and, and the, uh, impact of that is very much on everyone's minds. So my understanding is that a lot of investors are focused on like triaging there is ex existing portfolio companies and figuring out how to get them to be cash flow positive, or at least extend their runway as much as possible. So what has your response to all of this been? And what does it mean for founders that are looking for checks from Kima? Well, uh, just like everyone else, we've been focusing a lot on our portfolio companies. And, uh, and I mean, I, I think that before COVID, we were passing probably 80% of our time on deal flow and 20 mm. to 25% on portfolio companies. And it's the, it's the exact way around now. We passed 80% mm -hmm. of the time on portfolio companies and 20% on, on, on deal flow. Mm -hmm. um, and the job, I mean, a good founder is someone who has a, a clear, clar I mean, who has clarity of vision and clarity of vision, of strategic thinking, of execution. But when you go through a crisis like that and mm -hmm. it's your first one, you can miss the mark. So our job is to remind our portfolio founders what matters in those mm. tough time, and mm. that you need to keep enough runway until end of 2021, if you can. And if you can't, you need to think this through on how you're going to survive the next six, nine, 12 months of uncertainty. Mm. And uh, I mean, we're, we're co-investors with Blitz in, in, uh, in many companies. And, um, and I can tell you that it's been, I mean, the only subject of discussion is, is basically um, 
how, how do we ball rolling without mm. you know, killing the dynamic but keeping enough cash and it's a uh, lot mm. of, uh, of uh, compromises to make that are actually difficult to make mm -hmm. yeah um i imagine there's really a lot to do um i guess uh, looking at i guess how the founders in your portfolio companies have responded are there examples without naming names um of founders that have uh responded you know really well and really fast to covid or and also the other way around are there founders that have um you know kind of uh, really missed the mark and um and it would be great to to kind of share those lessons learned sure um i'm surprised i have found that probably if not all, most of the founders have responded incredibly well to the crisis. Uh, they've all taken measures. They've all required help from the investors in order to see clear and, and, and adjust to the situation. Um, so mostly we have seen some amazing behaviors from all sides. Um, Any examples you can share? Well, the, the examples are pretty sad because all of those companies, what they did, they, 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 they actually measures, measured uh, redundancy mm -hmm. uh, among the team, uh, which called for uh, firing people, mm -hmm. which is a tough decision yeah, to make. Yeah. And, and when you're a founder, your first reaction is, I'm going to lay off a first wave and then a second wave and then a third wave mm -hmm. is necessary. Mm -hmm. But the truth is you don't have that, that luxury because if you do that, you're going to kill the culture once, the culture twice and three times. Yeah. And this is going to kill your entire company. So it's better to do a large cutoff early on mm -hmm. and then progress with the team at maximum velocity and productivity and then hire back some people mm -hmm. later on mm -hmm. uh, rather than, you know, going after a first wave, second wave, third wave. It's impossible to, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of psychology, it's really bad for the team. So you should not do that. Mm -hmm. And some of our founders, they, they, you know, they were like, okay, we have nothing. Lots of uncertainty about how long it's gonna it's gonna last, about a second wave, about uh, uh, the the economy, etc. So because we have so much uncertainty, we should go one step after the other. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, when you go through a crisis, you need to um uh, basically um uh you need to be prepared for the worst and to mm -hmm. be prepared for the worst means that you need to act like that and mm -hmm. to take necessary tough measures even though you're gonna have to hire back in a couple of months or six months or nine months time mm -hmm. but uh, you cannot there are two things that you will never recover you will never recover time it passes and you need to be super productive with time. Mm -hmm. You need to, to maximize efficiency within the team and people must understand that because that's what will make the difference between the teams that will make it and the ones that don't. That, that don't. Mm. And then cash, you cannot recover cash. The cash that you burn every month, mm. it's, it's, it's gone. So it's better to save that cash uh, and, and save that energy and time by being efficient rather than waiting for things to happen before you actually do something. Mm -hmm. You have to do something right away. And so this is the thing that we've, this is the advice that we've given to all our portfolio founders. Mm -hmm. And this is what they've done, uh, most of them. And the one who have an actual really, I would say, react uh, fast enough, mm -hmm. you know, they probably reacted maybe one or two months late, but they all reacted at some point. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to something that you mentioned, um, which is uh, the word culture. So in mm -hmm. in times like this, how can you foster, I guess, the right type of culture, the right type of, um, you know, leadership um, to carry the team forward? That's a, that's a very interesting uh, question. Um, uh, we have many founders reaching out to us uh, with that uh, with this question. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, there's a good book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, mm -hmm. where it talks about the necessity of trust in order to bring constructive conflict, in order to make people committed and accountable to our results. Mm -hmm. It's a pyramid. Mm -hmm. And one way to build trust, and I think trust is, is fundamental, especially when, when you work 
uh, far away apart from each other uh, in remote mm -hmm. is to foster tolerance among the team. And tolerance uh, means that you need to be closer together. So mm -hmm. what in, there was this uh, anecdote uh, in the movie, in the in the not in the movie in the book where this woman CEO of a large Silicon Valley company brings the whole managing team in this Napa Valley retreat. And mm -hmm. during one morning, she asked to everyone to share um, an intimate story mm -hmm. about their past. Mm -hmm. And doing that, they're opening up to the others. Mm -hmm. And they also share something that is so defining um, from a character perspective mm. that explains some of their behaviors mm. and by and so people understand why they behave in a certain way and by understanding that they become more tolerant because they become more tolerant they trust each other etc etc mm. so we need to foster more cross um, um, collaboration more tolerance better understanding and so what we invite people to do is to pass more time cooking together, doing sports together, uh, sharing personal stories, mm. but also working, doing cro more cross collaboration among mm. teams mm -hmm. so that the sales understand what the product does, the product understand what the tech does, what mm. the sales are doing, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's, it's, I mean, and this is a topic of discussion at the moment, obviously, but diversity is a driver of, of performance. Mm. Because diversity force people to understand each other because we are so different. And when we are so different, we need to pass this time understanding each other in order mm. to collaborate. Mm -hmm. This is because we understand each other better than we can actually perform better as a team. Mm -hmm. Those are really good tips. Um, I'm going to bring some of those back to my team. So thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I guess we're officially going to move into the AMA. Um, and we have so many great questions. Um, I don't know if you have a few extra minutes at the end of uh, this webinar. Uh, if we can extend by maybe about 10 minutes, I think we can address uh, more of these uh, yeah. great questions. So thank you, Jean. Uh, so I want to pull one. Um, having so many companies in the portfolio, how much time can you spend with each startup? And how is how involved is Kima in their growth? Um, Kima is a joker in the hand of a founder. They don't know if we're going to be valuable or not at some point, mm. but they know they will never regret it because we are fast, we are nice. And so the value of Kima is that because we see so many things from our, from our portfolio founders, mm -hmm. we are sometimes able to react very quickly with a good answer, a good introduction, uh, a, you know, just uh, the right thing. Um, and so, one example, we have this company in the portfolio since 2016 called Eden, A-I-D-E-N, uh, that was sold to Twitter last year. Mm -hmm. uh, when Marie, the CEO, reached out to me last year to ask me, should I sell the company, raise a series, etc.? So I knew exactly the kind of question I should ask her. From there, I reached out to uh, to a couple of people. I cannot tell you the name, but Twitter included. And then I made sure they had a good deal. And, and it, it was very quick. It took me maybe three emails, 45 minutes, two meetings with Marie, and it was done. And for another 50 other companies mm -hmm. of our portfolio, mm -hmm. we, we won't do anything because they don't reach out to us. Or when they reach out to us, their subject is so specific that we are not able to help. Mm -hmm. Like this supersonic company <laughs> in, in, in San Francisco. Uh -huh. But what do I know about supersonic plane? You know, nothing. So I cannot help them really. But um, so we're a joker as when we came out. We, we, do, we make no promises as are we going to be instrumental. We try to, con we try to connect the founders with each other. We have this portfolio management platform called Paid Forward on which we have our Slack channels to share uh, new profiles, offices available, and things like that. And then we have a list of perks and a way for our founders to ask questions that are automatically dispatched to other founders, mm. to the most relevant founders, in order for them to help it for, for, for our founders to help each other. Got it, got it. Um, so it seems like a, a couple pieces of advice is uh, be proactive in reaching out to you and also be realistic. Yeah. <laughs> be realistic. 
Um, yeah. And then it sounds like there's a great sort of community resources and, and hubs um, for folks to help each other out. So that's great. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so this is a great question from Christine, actually. Um, what are you looking what are you looking for in the startups that you're investing today, which is different from the ones that you're looking at pre-COVID? Um, so it's 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 all a matter of um, of perception in a given situation. Pre-COVID, there were there were so many startups reaching out to us. I think we were probably less vigilant about the quality of the startup, the quality of the founders. And now we have more time. So we ask more questions. We are more diligent. And so it requires from the founders to be super strong because to have the guts to reach out to an investor during COVID to raise money, it means that uh, you're doing, doing a really good job. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think we are more diligent. And, uh, but nothing's changed. You know, it's always about do we believe there's a market opportunity? Mm -hmm. And do we believe that the teams that we have in front of us can actually address this opportunity? And it's always the same questions that we ask ourselves and ask the founders. But we are more diligent, that's it. Got it, got it. Um, let's see. This is also an interesting one. So 100 deals per year, any, any stage, deal size, sector, and geography. Uh, well, not technically not any stage, right? It's mostly seed and series A. Uh, but definitely uh, any sector and, and geography. How do you quickly judge valuation? Uh, we don't judge valuation. It's not our job. We put 150K a mm. hundred times a year. Our job is to be fast, not to, mm. not to optimize for valuation. Usually we just uh, you know, uh, go with, uh, with uh, I mean, if it's a YC company, it's always the same valuations. True. If there is a lead investor, we just you know go after the lead investor. Yeah. And if there is no lead investor and we are a bunch of business angels co-investing, it's always to take between between 15 to 25 percent of the company altogether. So you know we just discuss with the founder and try to reach a compromise very quickly. Got it, got it. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, Carol. Um, I saw a question flash earlier. Ah, this one. So these are really tough times, but also a window of opportunity. So Stripe, Airbnb, Square, et cetera, they're all born during the last recession. So can you talk a little bit about the sectors that you're putting on your short list these days? Uh, I've never been a fan of, of shortlisting uh, sectors because I believe that when a trend becomes a trend, mm -hmm. it means it's probably too late. So mm -hmm. you have to be careful about that. Mm -hmm. uh, our job is to detect the trend early on, not too early because otherwise we're wrong and the market is right and we right. get crushed, but it's to detect the trends beforehand. So I don't know, I, I like mobile consumer in general. So, and I'm obsessed with what's happening in the, in the space of, I think that, look, um, let's talk about WhatsApp, for instance. WhatsApp, Telegram, all those companies were born roughly in 2010. Mm -hmm. And then we had a bunch of chat applications uh, popping up through the lens of Facebook, of Snap, of Instagram, etc. But I think there's an opportunity to build a new uh, a new chat, which sounds very stupid and very simple, but mm. uh, a, a new kind of WhatsApp with better accessibility, better features. I don't know, better. Um, so this is the kind of things that I'm interested in for the moment, for instance. And then um, people say, hey, so all those companies were born during the crisis. Well, you know, a crisis doesn't last long. It lasts 18 months. So, you know, everything's born at any time, uh, any moment of time. We like to reassure ourselves with the fact that, you know, all those great companies were born and during tough time. That's great. But actually, great companies are born every day. True, true. So, yes. And I also uh, was watching uh, another video where you said, you know, at the end of the day, you're really investing in people, right? Not yes, sectors. So can do. you talk a little bit about that? Well, when we, so first, and, and I don't want to be, um, uh, huh, uh, we, we back people, uh, we back founding team, but more, more importantly, we back CEOs, CEOs. Mm -hmm. 
we we back one one person, one CEO, and we hope that this gonna it's gonna be a founding CEO, because whenever you're you're a tech person or a sales person and you're starting as a founding member member, mm -hmm. at some point you're gonna have to give away your job to someone who actually has already done that. So it's it's mm -hmm. it's very hard. It's very difficult for for a CTO or a sales uh, in their young age to grow with the company. Just very honestly, and I think that too too few people. Um, uh, they're talking about that. Mm. Uh, so with that CEOs, when we talk with the CEO, what we try to assess is um, three kind of what I call paradoxical tensions. The first one is you want someone who is very optimistic because you're an entrepreneur and you're going to deal with the issue mm -hmm. every single day. And so you need to be optimistic in order to, to overcome those mm. issues and to you know accept them. But the, the issue with optimism is that it kind of, of blur your vision. And so we need entrepreneurs with a good clarity of vision as well. So we need this, this dichotomy between clarity of vision and optimism, and it needs to be well balanced. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that we want entrepreneurs who are able to learn from the best, uh, and the best being books, uh, and but being people, to surround themselves with people who can help mm -hmm. them out. But also we want founders who are going to take singular decisions because if they want to build a singular story if they want to build something different at some point they need to do something different from others mm. so you need to have this dichotomy as well and the last thing and this is the most difficult part is in execution you want a founder you want founders to actually thrive through velocity and excellence and velocity mm. and excellence is very difficult to do both at the same time because really either you do things well or you do them mm. fast but to do that well and fast, eh, it's another story. Hmm. Interesting tips. Um, I think that's a really good segue to the book that you wrote, um, uh, Human Machine. So uh, you have three little ones at home and you have this huge portfolio of 850 startups and there's only 24 hours in a day. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, as you're kind of optimizing your, your life, um, you know, what was that spark? What was that moment where um, you were inspired to, to write this book and kind of, you know, share what you've uh, learned or found to be really useful with, with folks out there? Yeah. Um, so, uh, first of all, I think that we, we love to, to tell our uh, success stories, uh, but um, I, we, we are all failing all day long, all the time, <laughs> okay? And um, no exceptions, I'm failing all the time. Uh, I think that yesterday we were having dinner and uh, and one of my kids was telling me something and my wife looked at me and said, Jean, focus, listen, yeah. listen to him. And he's telling you something. And I was not focused at all. And I was thinking about something else. Um, and this happens all the time to all of us. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful about the image that we send to people and the kind of... Uh, of uh, we all have this sense of culpability and, and, and we all have our issues. But as for human machine, what happened quickly is that when I started to work with Xavier Niel uh, in 2015, mm -hmm. it was basically the, the, the dream job for me, the dream opportunity, and I didn't want to fail. And it was lots of pressure at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and we had we just I mean, we had three kids in 2010, 12, and 14. So it was 2015, you know. <laughs> Youngest is less than a year, is than a year old, and mm. uh, the oldest is less than five years right. old. So it was very intense. one after the other. But that yeah. was that. Yeah, one after the other. And I was mm. like, okay, I need to 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 put my shit together, you know, and and get my shit together and, and do this. Mm. And so I started to implement uh, some, um, you know, I don't know some tricks and some some routines. And one after the other, the compounded effect of all those routines. Mm -hmm happier to be kind of magical. And um, when I brought, and, and then I gave a workshop about this human machine concept. And um, I was not very happy with my performance and I wanted to write more in length about, uh, about this. And so I decided to write a book. And at the same time, I broke a feet, uh, one of my foot, uh, my, my right oh. foot is being squashed. And um, so I was at home for three mm. months. And uh, so I took some time to write. Uh, it didn't work out well, to be honest, because I started to write a book in French and it sucked. And then I left to the US for my annual trip. And there I wrote it 
I started all over again, but in oh, English, wow. and then I made it, and then it was translated to French. <laughs> that's, that's really uh, but so voila, mm -hmm. and um, and yeah, it was an experience for me. I, I, honestly, if I had to do it again, I would not do it. Yeah. Uh, because it was very hard mm. and I hated it. I mean, I loved it, but hated it at the same time. And uh, I'm not happy with the, I'm not, not that I'm not happy. I'm happy with the end result. It, it's, it's clearly, it can be perfected, but I won't do it because I don't, I don't want to do it. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it's an interesting experience to write a book. And, and what was the, the main message? If you could distill it down to 20 words or three points. Um, <laughs> well, the only way to make a change in your life mm. is to go step by step, uh, small step by small step. And the compounded effect of all those small steps are incredible. Mm. And start by saying no to people. Mm. It's worked very well. Well, I'm glad you didn't say no to us. <laughs> Obviously not. Um, <laughs> so uh, actually, on the, on the topic of books, uh, Celine is wondering what three books you'd recommend to every entrepreneur to read. Apart uh -huh. from human machine, of course, um, and to spice up the question, are there uh -huh. any that are w uh, written by women that you would recommend? Yes. Uh, so the first one is a book called uh, "The Pyramid Principle" mm -hmm. from a woman uh, called Barbara Minto, um, and it's about uh, uh, the logic in writing and thinking, and it's very useful because. We tend to go through conversations, through our emails, through discussions with people, and we forget how important it is to structure the way we, we, we think about things mm -hmm. and, 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 and write and tell them. And, um, and so this is a great book. It's very boring, but it's very useful. So read it. Uh, let's, let's, let's keep the... Um, the second one is called uh, Growth Mindset. Um, and it's from a woman as well, but I don't remember her name. Uh, shit, I don't. Okay. Um, and the third one would be Man's Search for Meaning uh, from Viktor Frankl, mm. um, who survived uh, the Shoah and Auschwitz and uh, then became a psychologist. And it's a uh, very it's it's short it's touching it's an interesting book it's uh i think it's a must read yeah that's going on my book list for sure um, so we have two women one man <laughs> we'll take it we'll take it um so we're really really you know grateful um that you are part of the epic pledge community um and so my next question is about purpose so, uh -huh. yeah. So, do you think that companies can achieve both profit and purpose? Um, it's it's. I, I don't think that anyone has ever gained any benefits or happiness from profits. You know, profit is the result of something. If the if the cause of of profit is purpose, it's extraordinary. Mm. So I get that we should all look for purpose first because it's with purpose that we do the best thing and it's through those best achievements that we probably generate profit. Um, and I remember we have, those, we have those, those couple of founders in our portfolio who say, oh no, you know, I don't want to sell my, I don't want to sell my solution to, to, I don't want it to be too expensive. I don't want people to pay for it too much. I don't want you to, to sell it or whatever. And, uh, but I want to do good to the world. And like, okay, but it's easier to be a billionaire and to do good than to do good by being poor. So maybe if you have this talent, you know, and you want to help, you know, the world, mm -hmm. please put this talent into, into, into work to generate profit so you can use those profit, you mm -hmm. know, for the purpose of, of helping the world. You know, that would be a great cause. And, um, and I admire that, uh, you know, the Bill Gates and, and of this world are, are doing this uh, because I think we, 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 we all expect from those uh, uh, successful billionaires at some point to, uh, to step up and, uh, and do the things that our governments fail to do. Absolutely. Um, and again, thank you for, for being a pleasure. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, 
investors that take the Epic pledge actually um, will uh, donate a percentage of their carry, uh, interest, carried yes. interest. So um, that will go uh, directly to supporting uh, the amazing social organizations in Epic's portfolio. So thank you so much. Um, and then I guess to wrap up, um, Alexandre is uh, wondering what your plans are after Kima. And then uh, I guess oh. coupled, coupled with that, there is a, another question from Theo, um, where he says, after so many years of working in the startup ecosystem as an investor, don't you want to start your own company and live this experience as a founder? Yeah. Um... It's an interesting question. I, we, we believe that a good, a fair, I mean, the, the more you work with startups and the more ambitious you, you get. And um, I think we like to believe that the good entrepreneurs are obsessed uh, with, with, with what they're doing. And so in order to be an entrepreneur, you need to be obsessed by, by what you're working on. Mm. And, um, and the thing is, uh, my obsession is people. And that's why I'm in venture capital. And that's why mm. I think I, I, I do this job with the right purpose. Um, mm. Maybe one day I will gain more attractivity into something that will push me push me out of, of venture. Uh, Supersonic airplanes, maybe. For instance, <laughs> <laughs> I will I will teach myself on YouTube and then become a a, a, a space uh, pilot, an engineer. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, but the truth is, uh, is uh, for me, there is no. I mean, Kima is not a phase. Um, I started to work with uh, Xavier Niel. And I think that um, uh, there is no after Kima. It's, it's, it's what, what can we do with Xavier as long as we're aligned uh, with the fact that we want to work together. And it can be Kima, but it can be anything else. Um, I, like, uh, I, I like how we work. Um, I admire um, you know, uh, his views and the fact that he trusts people to try to make good things. Um, and um, yeah, and he, he likes to take risk and, and he's uh, accessible and I love working for him and with him. So my take is not about Kima, it's what can we do next with Xavier? So it sounds like uh, business is very much uh, open. So for all of the founders in the room who are cooking up something really interesting, uh, be proactive um, and reach out to uh, Kima with your fabulous pitch decks. Be ready, because he's going to grill you, apparently, uh, harder <laughs> than usual. Um, but uh, yeah, excited to see what's in store for Kima. Excited to see what other uh, interesting startups uh, you're going to be investing in. Um, so with that, again, thank you so much for your time and sharing your advice and your insights. Um, I think that's all been really helpful. Um, and I think uh, there's about eight uh, uh, founders in your portfolio companies who have joined us today. So hopefully they've uh, gotten some, some nice <laughs> uh, nuggets of uh, inspiration here. Um, so before we close, um, just really wanted to thank everyone for joining us over the past six weeks for Epic's inaugural uh, Epic Pledge webinar series. We've heard uh, such great feedback that we're planning to host more of these. And so please stay tuned. Um, we're gonna have more in July. Uh, so that will be a, a fun way to continue uh, conversations like this. And then uh, before we um, wrap up for the day, I wanna ask one more favor from everyone. So when the webinar ends, uh, please stick around for an extra five seconds. You'll automatically be, um, uh, or you'll automatically see our fancy Super Bowl commercial pop up about the Epic Pledge. Um, we're just a really cool community uh, focused on helping you weave purpose into your life and business and hope that you will join us. Um, and in fact, there are some familiar names uh, in the room. So shout out to our pledgers at Seed Legals, Voy, Worldia, Alvin Capital, Luisa, and of course, Blease. Um, and Cedric, we see you too. Uh, so. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, please stick around for the, the five seconds and reach out to us at Epic Pledge at epic.foundation if you have any questions or want to chat more. Um, otherwise, see you all in July. And Jean, could not thank you enough. Thank you so much. This was the thank perfect you, for us to wrap up our uh, first series. So it was perfect. Thank you. Take care and stay safe. Cheers, everyone.